Yeah, so thank you very much, Professor Osman, for your um, very kind presentation. I hope to honor it with this, uh, with my own presentation. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much to the Kete Hamburger Collect for bringing me, you know, all these months of like relax and discussion with colleagues to extend my my impression of legal pluralism. And yeah, I hope that you know the relation will keep on now that I'm living. So yeah. Um, in an empire as big as that of Rome, one of the elements that speaks most strongly about its relatively high level of integration was the commerce that took place along its different shores. However, long distance commercial relationships were formed by people who had a level of trust among them and unknown people. Still nowadays, commercial transactions found validation in the will and actions of the parties involved. And this way of conducting trade was especially prevalent in nearly all pre-modern societies, as it is the Roman, which typically struggled with weak formal institutions and lack of enforcement capabilities, relying heavily, therefore, on co-opting and adapting imposed formal institutions to pre-existing practices and rulings. Many of the different commercial practices used by merchants across the Mediterranean were then justified by culturally transmitted beliefs, encapsulating fundamental values and worldviews. Today, I will talk about what the merchandise and concretely the inscribed merchandise tell us about trade and the legal framework surrounding Roma commercial relations, and especially for of what was considered law from the point of view of the merchants uh, conducting trade. Nowadays, uh, when a consumer walks into a supermarket, the sales are packed with different products, each competing for their attention. And in such an environment, behind the brand savvy packaging and labeling designed to grab the consumer's attention, there is a whole network of full regulations, as the product information should be accurate, honest, and contain comprehensive information. The situation was quite different in the Roman world when commercial containers displayed a formulaic and abbreviated set of inscriptions that were not meant to be understood by the public at large, but only by the people involved in trade. Therefore, Commercial descriptions are evidence of transactional practices between different commercial actors and operated in relation to the legal framework chosen by the parties involved in the commercial operations, guided, uh, sorry, guided by formal and less formal institutions, customs, and social norms. So my work here seeks to, um, seeks to understand the significance of these inscriptions in such transactions, how they were understood by different commercial actors, and how they fit inside the commercial legal world of the Romans. So my work argues that commercial inscriptions were influenced by the legal universe of the actors in trade, the language employed in the writings and its features can be a demarcating line between different legal practices. My research uh, here started thanks to my work in the ERC Portus Limen, uh, which deal with commercial ports of the Mediterranean. Here in the slide, you can find uh, some of the ports that were part of the project. And um, this uh, is meant to give you some context of where I have started some of my sources. Uh, with regard to these sites, uh, in recent years, there has been a growth in the conception of ports as systems in the sense that they cannot be understood only in relation to the sea, but they need to be understood also in relation to inland and with other ports. They occupy these positions and constitute port systems, that is, a set of interdependent parts that form an integrated whole. Therefore, a central concept to bear in mind here is that of connectivity. And this connectivity, in fact, implies interaction within subjects of different legal backgrounds and different access to justice. It also implies that individuals will operate in multi-legal contexts and in order to get the best result of their commercial operations, it will be necessary for the diverse actors to find some common ground as to make their operations intelligible in different contexts as well as valid and enforceable. Uh, the map of this slide shows some of the main places of discovery of the inscribed commercial objects in my work. I must say that my selection is a bit subjective in the sense I have like a corpus of more or less like 4,000 inscriptions that keeps on, on growing. And, um, the map here, as you can appreciate, there are some that are found in land, but they were arrived there via uh, maritime, uh, the maritime ports, and then they are in line. And also one thing that you will appreciate is like there are less inscriptions in the east of the empire. Um, and in fact, in these areas, what is interesting is like the inscription they have found, uh, they come normally from the west. So this absence of written objects in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, you know, they have several hypotheses to explain that. 
there could be like an absence of evidence due to the you know like um, uh, different trade routes and different supply and demand. Maybe like you know some trade routes maybe they were internal and they didn't really flow to the west. And uh, difference on evidence because of uh, predominance of different commercial practice. Um, maybe because some of the goods that were exported to the west were perishable and they have not survived to last. Uh, they can be also like an absence of publications or a different epigraphic culture that concern, in what concerns the merchandise, what could be in connection with a pre-Hellenistic trade system that stayed under the unification of the Roman Empire. And even though this hypothesis needs much more work and data compilation from my part, uh, one possibility that will not surprise me is the existence of the different epigraphic culture, displaying local mentalities and practices from merchants from different areas of the empire. So in this talk, I will briefly consider two themes that are especially relevant to my book, the one I'm working now here, uh, namely communication between jurists and commercial practitioners as well as, well as legal intelligibility between commercial actors. On the one hand, through the study of commercial epigraphy, my aim is to grasp whether the jurist textual works on commerce correspond or not to the actual practice of trade and the reasons behind the coherence or difference. On the other hand, the goal is to see how merchants from different backgrounds, like cultural, social, and, and legal, as we know that the principle of legality is, uh, is uh, personality, so uh, in the Roman world, understood each other through the abbreviated and formulaic inscriptions written on merchandise and established agreements in consequence. The study of these commercial inscriptions and the comparison between them allowed me to establish a system to classify these artifacts, showing the common elements that have occurred in uh, different of them. And uh, for this system, I have used this, uh, this labeling that in fact corresponds to one developed by Stephanie Martin Kilcher in 1994 and later taken up by uh, Fanel Lovenemer in 2004. Um, I have also respected the system uh, for the amphora address at 20. For the ones that I'm not familiar with that, these are amphora related to public supply oil from Spain. They have a very characteristic epigraphic record. That's why I have respected what Dressel made, you know, the Greek letters. But this will be like the actual system of inscription and how I have labeled them. Initially, this system that I have used uh, was developed for amphora, but I have decided to use it across the board for different artifacts as they are some aspects that appear regularly in Austin objects. So product, weight, or the merchant names, regardless from the support. Um, the use of a particularly shortened writing system and complex handwriting indicates that the people involved in commerce have created their own code when inscribing these artifacts. And these artifacts and their epigraphic record, while not constituting contracts by themselves uh, in the institutional way of seeing them, reflect elements of the agreements in which they were involved and therefore constitute proof of transactions being carried out. I'm thinking concretely of the main contracts employed in trade, so being a sale of letting and hiring that were both consensual and available for both Roman citizens and foreigners. Uh, the problems of the research at the moment has been that the rigid separation between law and material culture in both legal and archaeological studies underlines the idea that law is an isolated phenomenon from, uh, from society created by elites who rule from above and represent the thoughts of those who created the law rather than the people who are actually using, using it. The latter has forced many scholars to think about commercial law in some sort of rigid way as if merchants needed to conform about uh, commercial law in, uh, to the standards of public institutions, instead of adapting and co-opting legal institutions to their advantage and the needs or their business activities. On the other hand, in the archaeology, the systematic separation among artifacts based on their shape and the associated product has led to the misconception that each commodity belongs to different legal phenomena. So people study wine on one side, oil on one side, not understanding that in fact they are made part of the same legal contracts. Um, so in this regard, on one of the novelties of my research is that I have studied all these kind of different products across the board. And I think that as epigraphic artifacts, these inscriptions are linked to the influence and importance of Roman culture along the Mediterranean, and therefore are very close to the Roman legal framework. But as legal artifacts, they reflect a connection with Roman law, but they could travel to different areas of the Mediterranean world with different legal traditions persistent, like Hellenistic, Jewish, or even customs. So, in fact, they are an example of what we were saying this afternoon, law in action. 
Um, commercial descriptions are written in different parts of the merchandise and use different techniques. Here you can find that in looking at my assemblage of more than 4,000 inscriptions, this is the kind of article that I have, that I have been studying and the different techniques that have employed that allow me to see different actors writing the details on that. I use this approach to understand the epigraphy of the artifact with the aim of like specifying under which conditions and one technique and language should be used identify the type of event that occurs and link the absence of this type of technique to different events or conditions. A better understanding of the condition of these inscriptions in turn allows to better reconstruct the path and the commercial context of the artifacts within the production and distribution cycles. And in fact, in this map here, uh, in this figure of the slide, you can see how it connects the different kinds of writing techniques with the associated moments in the merchandise of the distribution cycle. And then you can identify the different following scenarios where the techniques are applied to objects. So the place of production, as a kiln or a state or a workshop where the object was stamped, burned with wood, or uh, indicating production. Then the container can be filled, like for example, an amphora foil will be filled there, sealed, and painted to indicate details about the production or ownership. For example, handwritten inscriptions such as graffiti were normally written in more informal fashion and included personal messages, uh, which were meant to be read by the artisan working in the kill, in the case of, for example, this Dressel 20 amphora that I had mentioned before concerning oil, or for example, by the final consumer in the case of like, for example, we have found in Pompeii or the, in the Athenian Agora. Then we can find, for example, another context would be the pro or top preparation of departure where the goods are loaded into a ship. And then if the bases were not already marked, they could have been painted and marked there. And for that, we have examples in some papyri that reflect like uh, there are some letters, for example, written from one merchant to the other, or from other to the other saying like, I have painted this, the, this amphora and you will get there with my name. Then other scenario will be the ship uh, carrying the goods. If the ship, for example, changes its itinerary or the goods are transferred to another vessel, they will be marked again, leaving the names that correspond to the new carrier in charge of the transport uh, written in a different calligraphy. I will give you an example of that when I show the case studies. Then the, the next case in our, uh, context will be the port of destination, where the goods will have been checked by the customs or registration that sometimes can leave also marked, like stamps used mainly for goods uh, intended for state supplies. Or, for example, in the case of marble uh, for public buildings, and um, sometimes there are painted descriptions indicating issues relating to the registration of goods. Finally, the market of shop uh, where goods were sold, that here normally we have the normal examples of like either the goods transporting wood are transvasted to different vessels, and then they are painted again indicating ownership, or they are the graffiti marks that normally reflect personal messages. The traceability of these operations attested by the inscriptions includes the overall path represented in the model of the slide, which allows again to include the scenarios with the different procedures that take place in the distribution cycle from the good that departs from a port till it gets to the context of the distribution of sale. In all my experience in looking at inscriptions in more than 23 ports, what I have realized looking at the archaeological evidence is like there probably will have been geographical variations on how these procedures were implemented, but the archaeological evidence shows that in overall, these activities will have been practiced widely around the Roman Mediterranean. So that gives us a framework of like how practices are being made. Then obviously there are, we need to go case by case to see how merchants are actually operating. So I have studied, I'm sorry, because there are a lot of diagrams. I know that in legal history, we are not used to that, but it's the part of being an archeologist as well. So I have studied this commercial epigraphy and here you can see the different inscriptions that I label are related to the different elements uh, because I have related these to, as I said, to one of the two main contracts employed in trade that are the contract of sale. So as you know, or for the ones that are not lawyers, uh, this contract implies Hand, uh, handling goods in exchange of a price. This contract implies the existence of a risk, uh, bearing of a risk prior to the actual transference of the product sold. And as a rule, this risk was borne by the buyer from the moment the, the item was handled and before it was assumed by the seller, which will have and take the seller responsibility to carry out all these procedures mentioned in the model until the asset had, you know, had been finally entrusted to the buyer. Secondly, transport, I have studied this function through the focus on less and higher. 
One of the most common contracts uh, used for navigations with the risk of the journey are distributed among different actors. It consisted mainly of one person, the lessee, renting something from another person, being a ship, the space on a ship, or their workforce. As I will explain through an example later, given the flexible nature of this contract, in fact, uh, what merchants are doing is like they use it a bit to their own advantage. But the problem, again, on the studying the sources of the digest is that because the juries explain them in a very concrete way and, re and referring to concrete functions of that contract, it can give the impression to legal scholars, also partly because many of them have done this uh, pandectistic and dogmatic understanding comparing them to English contracts, that uh, these contracts of Latin and Harry were kind of modelic and they correspond to a certain function. And they were used in a certain way for one concrete function. But in fact, the archaeological evidence shows that they were way more flexible and merchants were kind of mixing these kind of model contracts to use them for different functions. So this is what I will show you later with an example. Finally, uh, what they call control consisted of several procedures for the collection, inspection and documentation and quantification of the goods distributed. And this supposed a uh, constraint on one side, the Roman state, and on the other, to the other being the merchant. So these control procedures such as tasting, weighing, and registration goods were carried out in the context of contracts as well, and make possible to understand the complex organization in the Roman administration of ports. So, so far I have explained to you, I hope more or less in a clear way, how the study assemblage of commercial inscription uh, provides information about the procedures that took place during commercial distribution and describe the pattern of this distribution cycle. In the following slide, I would like to give you some case studies to actually show you, you know, how I put in practice everything that they have been saying here. To start with, uh, the Roman city of Arelate or Arles in the south of France is one of my most studied case studies, basically because there's a lot of evidence there. There's like the port river in the Delta Rhone where goods were redistributed. So basically this is what we call a river port and a point of redistribution. Like goods come from the sea and they are you know, unloaded into different ships, they get up there. And also from there, they are also redistributed in different ships to get towards the north through different areas of France or even towards Germany. One procedure that was characteristic from this wrong distribution was transshipment, which is a perilous moment in transport and will expose the carrier to potential liability if things go wrong then proper management of the ship and the right choice of crew are indicated as the precautions that the shipper should have considered to ensure the safety of the transshipment. The sources of the digest suggest that the carrier should inform the customer if the goods have to be transshipped during the journey to estimate the risk assumed. In cases like this, in the Rome Valley, when the transshipment was at the necessary stage of the voyage and the captain was not responsible even if the transshipment had not been previously agreed. However, however, these pre uh, peculiarities of transport agreements are only phrased by jurists and invisible to us, since no transport contract has been preserved in the west of the empire. And Egyptian papyri inform us about the duties of the career, but not how, uh, how, uh, uh, how these uh, particularities were put into practice by the actors in trade. So in this sense, so now for that you can find, is there a pointer here? No, oh, yeah, well, anyway, it's fine. Uh, so Manfred found in Cologne, in uh, Mainz, or in Aux, uh, uh contained further inscriptions uh, added later. So here you have description number D that refers to the name of the merchant. And then description F, that is like a vertical inscription in, in, written next to that, that was written by a different calamus, so we had different hand. Uh, referred to uh, several abbreviated tria nomina, which sometimes are coincident with the name of the merchants and sometimes differ. As you can see here, there's the name of this Lucius Ulitis Berecundi, which is a very well known merchant working with oil and with fish sauce. In this case, it's called Amphora from seed sauce. And in the inscription next to it, you can find here that sometimes there is LDB, so supposedly refers to the name of the merchant. Then we suppose that there are agents working for that merchant in that concrete port. As you can see, there are other different three anomalies, so maybe these are basically other agents working on their own or maybe working for other merchants that actually, you know, like, like were involved in the transport for this very big one. Um, so another thing will be that the numbers next to that, uh, we have been trying to put the numbers in relation to the weight and the capacity of the liquid inside the amphora, but the problem there is like they don't really match at all. So then we think that maybe this refers 
to the number inside the whole cargo. So for example, that will be the number number 75, uh, you know, the merchant is probably a Torbi, but there's a uh, agent working perhaps for this Lutius or Iptus Verecundis that is taking charge of this cargo. So this will be the main hypothesis. And this implies, as I have said, the presence of agents in the port where the cargo was transferred to another ship. So the object was tracked once it was about to be transshipped from the first ship that was loaded into, indicating who was taking care of it, and in the case of the Uriti, whether they were part of their network of transport or not. Other vessels found in the Rhone Valley and in Lyon bear the description Arelate, as you can see here, Arelate and Arelate, so basically the city of Agla. And they are written differently than the other inscriptions in the amphora. Uh, this last case was an amphora uh, from, coming from Massalia, so Marseille, uh, and found in Lyon with the name of the receiver called in dative, so Stayo Regilio, as you see there in the, in the down. And description referring to Agla, as I said, written with a different uh, hand and using a different ink. So the amphora probably arrived to Lyon via Agla. And another example is this amphora on the top, bearing the description Arelate, that was neither produced in Arl nor found there, but in the Rhone Valley. So it can be proposed as well that this amphora traveled via the port of Arl and was marked there, which would suggest the existence of different practices of marking items passing through the port of Arl and Lyon. The way I explain this, the reason for the existence of different marking systems could be explained by the nature of the associations, guilds, or collegia involving commerce that operate in the two ports. While numerous professional associations have been uh, attested at both Lyon and Arles, their organization seems to have differed, with Arles showing a tighter cooperation between the different strands of shipping professionals, so in fact being quoted as corpus um, Relatensis, so basically working all as a whole, when in fact in Lyon there are different guilds or associations quoting in different inscriptions, so working separately. So here we will be facing an example of how the merchants organize their transport, also evidencing their affiliation and their organization, depending if they were part of a guild or a collegia, they work for agents for one merchant or independently. The practice of writing this artifacts had a legal meaning for the parties involved in these procedures because obviously they were taking charge of these cargos that were being transported. And these are obviously not mentioned in any official source or recognized in any public institution. Other case presented in this slide shows an inscribed sample jar through its epigraphic apparatus and its archaeological features allows us to see many traits of the procedure that I have described in the model before. It constitutes a sample or a specimen which travel with a load of grain. This is quite common in, in, in cargo sent in bulk. So because you put grain in bulk in a ship, normally you will carry a, a sample with it to basically attest that the quality of the grain that you have loaded is the same that the one that is inside the, the sample. So on the one hand, the sample represents a sale of generic goods. In this case, grain sold in bulk, and I will go later to this, this case concretely, uh, the case of samples and gen sale of generic goods, as well as the inscriptions written on it reveals also details about the agreements used to manage the transport of the goods. So it's a mixture between a contract of sale and a contract of transport. I will start off by focusing on the description and therefore the transport of goods to later provide some details concerning to the sale of generic goods. This small container uh, was found in a place called the House of Epidios Primos in Pompeii in 1946. And uh, more or less then we can obviously uh, propose the terminus antequem of this subject in 79 AD due to the, ex uh, the explosion of the Vesuvius. And as for the terminus postquem, I can suggest then the first century because during the time of Julius Caesar as dictator, he proposed a better access uh, to grain through the use of a new port in Ostia along the Canal of Terracina. The inscription was written by four hands. Um, if I had a pointer, I can. Ah, okay, here. So the four hands can be seen. There's one hand here. Here there are two hands. So basically, different people writing the inscription. This will be one. And I don't know if you can see it here clearly, but this is way thicker. So we assume that this is written by another calamus. Also, the message is very different. And then on the back, you have this inscription that is obviously very different than the others, and it's written with another artifact that is basically a paintbrush. Um, 
Um, so I am not going to really be talking that much about the last inscription because this probably refers to a reuse during the, when the sample actually uh, arrived to, uh, to Pompeii because it passed through Ostia. But uh, yeah, basically, this, this we, ask the, we think that this is all part of one transaction. So the amphora arrived to Ostia and then get to was transferred there and get to Pompeii, and then the rustico probably was written. But this is something very problematic because rustico is a very banal name. So I'm not really sure about that. Um, so to be more clear here, the first line mentions exemplar or sample, hence the Latin term for yeah sample. Uh, following line reflects the load mentioned that uh, that goes with the grain sample, referring to this and uh, a measure of volume of, of or modi here. This description refers also to the next line, which describes the ship's capacity, because it is from, from it is from the volume of goods loaded that the customer in the lease and rental agreement will be agreed on the price. So basically the, the price of the contract normally is agreed by the volume that is loaded. Uh, the first element that appears mentioned in the next line is the identification of the ship, as you can see, and it says it is uh, transported in a ship called Kumba. This is a kind of ship. It's a particular of medium-sized transport ship, and the calculations on the amount of grain loaded seems that it was fully loaded. This next line then indicates the uh, identification of the ship. As you say here, as you see here, is the property of this uh, Pompeius Saturus. It's in the protection of Jupiter and Juno. It has a distinctive sign of victory, and after the orders of here is the name of the captain, and it's domiciled in Clopia, that is the actual Tunisia. So all of these are elements that, in fact, help to know where the cargo is loaded and who is responsible for it. And in the case of also, in, there's some problem, because it's this guy's domicile in Clopia is where you need to go in case there's some problem with the cargo as well. So this uh, identification implies the duties for which the, the, the captain has been assigned will be carried out in this specific ship. So here we are probably talking about the letting and hiring of a whole ship. Uh, it indicates the, to register the cargo entrusted to the carrier, identifies the, the origin of the ship at the entrance of the port when it's passing the taxis, and then to trace and accept the ship in the event of, a dispute, of the dispute. So all the details in this part of the inscription relate to recurring elements to transport contract of letting and hiring and were written when the sample was loaded into the ship, presumably because it would be the summary of a contract that was filled at the port of departure, a practice that is attested in Barry's papyri. These elements make it possible to identify the subject of the transport contract and to determine who is responsible. The second part uh, that was, uh, was written when the, this part written by us, uh -huh, was written when the good, uh, when the jar arrived to the destinations and then Ostia, as you can see here, the port of Ostia nearby Rome. Then it, we assume that it was the price of the transport sitting there. And I'm not gonna here talk about the exemption of taxes because it will be too long. And honestly, it doesn't really matter that much for the concept of transport indeed. Uh, the place of execution of the contract, being in this case Ostia, can be determined in advance uh, by the parties, but in the case of goods transported in bulk, the, uh, the place of delivery should be indicated in the contract because it's the way where the contract could be claimed in case something goes wrong. So here we have then the importance of quoting Ostia as a locative. The next element of description will be the gerundive solvendo, which will be then translated as resolve, settle, which reflects to the breaking of this bond to deliberation. And in general, solutio refers to the form of termination of an obligation, which is an indication of what is due and it must be performed in the same way as it was contracted for. So indeed, uh, this last part that has been the most controversial in the past because there have been a group of very pronounced scholars like Andre Cermia and Jan Andro, and maybe you know her names or not, but anyway, they published like a couple of articles in Mefra proposing that this will be sine fraude. And I basically have write two articles re 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 replying to them that this will be solutio facta. Why? Well, first of all, when they quote in the first article the sources for sine fraude, it didn't make any sense because they quote source of the digest that sine fraude is referred to obligations that refer to a real transaction or, for example, a manumissio of slaves, at, uh, you know, testamentary practices, etc. So nothing related to the handle of goods that are, you know, like movable, as the case of grain. Then as well, 
I propose also the fact of solutio facta, not only because also it refers to actual the practice of like paying the, 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 the obligation, paying for the contract, but also because uh, solutio facta is recurrently referred also in the sources for contracts that are uh, consensual, as in the case of transport. So finally, we had a meeting like a month ago in Paris, and finally they agreed with me. So now I can say that at least my hypothesis is okay to go. And um, yeah, so um, the agreement representing these five vessels here corresponds to a list and hires, like I said, uh, one of these most common, you know, used on the switching trade. And uh, in this case, as I have been telling you before, this contract has been understood, especially by scholars like as Roberto Fiori from the University of Roma Tre in Rome, as a contract that was separated in three ways and there were kind of model contracts. But indeed, I think that this shows in fact that even if the jurist are writing of this contract as a kind of modelic way and a standard way, like you have a contract for leasing a seat, you have a different contract for you know, leasing the space on a ship. This is because, you know, the, the jurists are kind of like trying to be practical and trying to identify the object of a contract in case that there's some problem. But this, in fact, shows that this is a mixture of the both contracts because the fact that they are occupying the whole ship for this probably shows that it was a letting and hiring of a ship that normally will imply, you know, only the letting and hiring of the ship and that's all. But the fact that you, they, they are including in all the amphorae, the elements of the, you know, where the ship is, uh, the details of the ship and where it's solved, it shows an obligation of result that normally will correspond to the model of uh, locatio conducti of the space on the ship. So basically they are mixing two legal models to summarize. And in fact, this shows in fact that merchants are kind of like adapting the legal framework to their advantage and kind of like doing what is practical for them, or at least this is my opinion. And the last case, sorry, I hope not to be boring you so much. Uh, as I have been saying, that was a sample, and the use samples are not only evidence of transport practices, they are also connected to the sale of generic uh, goods or goods in bulk. Uh, were profusely used in Roman trade, even if we unfortunately have a very scarce evidence, they are recurrently mentioned in papyri but they are not at all mentioned in uh, private juridical sources. This case, for example, that I'm very proud of because I was telling Professor Osman about this, I have just recently got permission to study these two inscriptions in Tarentum. They are a unique example of samples used in the sale of wine. And I'm very excited because they were just vaguely published in uh, 1971 and there's a need of like doing the epigraphic apparatus and the photos for doing the, the you know, the study, the correct study of this inscription. So, as I said, uh, for what concerns the uh, legal evidence, there is no um, direct mention of the use of these samples by the jurist uh, in the Justinian Digest, that, as you know, is a compilation of sources of private law written by juries, normally bureaucrats working for the empire. And there's only one uh, mention of the samples in this source of the Theodosian Code. But on the one hand, um, you know, we need to know that the Codex Theodosianus is a collection of imperial constitutions, so many rescripta, which have a closer connection to the realities of trade. These are basically, um, you know, uh, they are re uh, replies to questions asked by the citizens of the empire. So that's why they refer more to the practical, you know, like, like uh, realities of the empire. So that there's one a reason why they, they are mentioning here this secret sample here. Um, on the one hand, I have to say that uh, with regard to the public distribution of food, also it's normal that they are referring to the samples because as I said, they are quite attested for the transport of grain and, you know, like, like them to promote, uh, but uh, the thing is like samples were not only used in public transport of goods uh, for public distribution as, as grain, but also they were used as it is in the case of this other sample of Tarento that I have mentioned before. This is one used in, in a private trade. This is one used concretely to show, you know, where was the um, dolia, where the wine has extracted and to refer to the quality. So this is the kind of thing that we will not see in the, in the, in the, in the private sources. So then one of my questions was, are samples a practical part of commerce, which finds their value and legal meaning in, you know, what the practice of traders, 
or uh, is basically that lawyers and legislators are not mentioning them because they are so recurrently used and they are so common use that they don't really find that it was necessary to mention them. Uh, from reading Roman legal sources, there were two points that should not be taken as a sign of disconnection from commercial realities. The first being that uh, we cannot assume that juries have the same knowledge of all the technicalities involving commerce, the same as practitioners did. And secondly, sometimes that lawyer mentions commercial tools and, and as, you know, as a methodological and didactic exercise describing principles in commerce in order to provide a very example of cases. So maybe they are not really that interested on, you know, referring to tools of commerce like these samples. Um, but indeed, you know, I think um, um, that when we read the sources of law of, the, of commerce described by the juries, it will be surprising given the different cases that they provide, that they were completely isolated to the practical realities in Rome when in fact commerce was so no systematized, but also was something you know that was recurrently used for people of different legal statuses and so important for the Roman Empire. So in short, as I do not have really time to develop my argument here about this, I don't think that the absence of mention of samples in the text of the juries corresponds to a lack of contact with reality, but to the fact that you know, the writings were eminently practical and they sought to provide case studies. Um, and in fact, many of the elements uh, referring the contract using commerce by the juries uh, can be linked indirectly to this use of samples. Uh, so for example, the fact that some, um, some produce need to be tasted to refer to the quality, um, or the need to identify a shipment sold in bulk, or the, pro the, the possibility of contracting the acquisition of a product sold in a different place, and you know, the, after tasting testifies the importance of samples in the Roman Empire. So uh, the general discourse, um, sorry, that's why I gave you the, the handout because this source is just so, so long that I thought, but if you can see it well there is fine. Uh, the general discourse to emphasize here, regarding the use of samples is that of the goods sold in bulk. Why is important? Because classical Roman law has never broken with its refusal to recognize the sale of generic goods. These cases were not considered to satisfy the requirement of identification of the, of the object of a contract. And it was not certainly because it didn't happen because obviously I have showed you already the case of the sample on the grain sold in bulk. And examples of that can be found in, you know, different kinds of shipwrecks of the Mediterranean. So what we can say is like large quantities of goods could be sold, provided they were identified at least as a mass or at least identified thanks to this sample that I'm referring here. Um, the conventional view is that law can afford this uh, restrictive approach precisely because the stipulation was always available, but the problem is like, even if juries have said that, uh, there, we have no examples of like this stipulation being used in this. So basically we are here facing the fact of like, supposedly it's all in, uh, goods sold in bulk were not really that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, fitting with the realities of like how the contract of sale was um, mm, explained by the Roman juries, but in fact that in practice they happen all the time. So the story that we have here in, uh, refers to Gaius. Gaius is a jurist from the second century AD. And it refers to the special legal rules that apply to the sale of those things that which are determined by weight, number, or measure, like in the case of you know, grain or um, oil or etc. So following Gaius, what we can do is set a single global price for the whole object, whatever the amount. So identifying, for example, all the wines sold in my cellar or a hundred and four I that are in my house. Um, I will intend to show you this because this, for example, could be the case of the wreck identified as the Grand Ribot de, loaded with Dolia. As the archaeological evidence has shown, the use of these ships was linked to the use of structures located in the port that were used you know, to bring the wine outside directly to the cellar located in the port. So basically this will be the case of like the way to identify the transport or the sale of all the, of the, these goods in bulk will be all the dolia in, in, inserted in this ship. Um, so that is as probably a sign that the wine was identified as a unit aboard the ship and sold probably at a single price. Other options selling generic goods uh, will be established by Gaius was that determining the price per unit, as for example, five sesterci for each pound. 
The other example of here comes from, again, from Aglob, from my colleague David Jawi, that uh, in the Rome Delta, we can find, um, well, as I said, it's a place from transshipment, it's a place where goods are repackaged in different containers. So in this case, they have, they have found these different jars bearing the initials of the anomina of different merchants and that they have thought that they were used to, uh, you know, pass the wine sold in bulk into different smaller containers. So this will be the case of five sesterchi for each pound that are, you know, for example, included in the sort of, of uh, jars. So in these scenarios, uh, samples will act as warranties that the products product measured out and sold in bulk, an evidence material element that provide validity and reinforce trust in the age of the in the eyes of the merchant, even if not mentioned in the official legal sources. So uh, samples are one of these cases in which we can appreciate the law in action or merchants in action. These objects, as I said, represent diverse, diverse contractual schemes. They're different and the different uses depend of the product and the context and in some, the practical world of commerce. For example, the use of samples as a means of selling products is evidenced by this recent discovery uh, in uh, Agla. This is a very fascinating jar. Um, it consists of a jar containing wine from the uh, Monsalvanos in Gaul, and the inscription reads, as you can see here, the name of the written genitive, so it will be like the name of the owner of the state. And then obviously, um, Dolia Centum Quadratin Dutch Exaginaria are, you know, uh, referring to the amount of Dolia of this sort of wine that are located in this, so in this uh, estate, in this sort of like warehouse then. Because obviously the jar is like this, it just kind of contains this, this 140 jars, as you can imagine. So here it will be the case that the sample is identifying a sale in bulk of this sort of like, like uh, well, this, uh, this wine. So here we are dealing of uh, an acquisition of wine that proceeds from a concrete stock. And then the buyer will find here two varieties. The first one that will be to buy the entire stock of uh, 140 and 40 jars uh, for a whole price. Or then obviously the other option that will be, you know, saying, no, I would like, you know, like, like a, I don't know, 20 jars of like a, this sort of wine. Um, it will seem, yeah, for me, a little bit difficult that they will buy like 140 jars, but in this case will be uh, not, for example, the seller will be not responsible for the oxidation of the wine because when you buy a good in bulk, the only possibility you have to be responsible for tasting is like you include this disposition in the contract. If not, it's, it's uh, transmitted as a total when sold. Uh, the different question will be if the vinum albano was sold then in amphorae or barrels and um, here on the perfection of the contract purchasing quantity, the fact that the seller is already encumbered with the responsibility of custody for the mensura, uh, then shows that the purchase of a part of the wine is inseparable, not as a legal act, uh, like a conditional purchase, but it's imperfect and is that only the absorption of the risk by the buyer is postponed because you know, it cannot be otherwise since the purchase object may, might be first be created. However, uh, the purchase contract is not denied perfect as a legal act. Uh, the purchase contract does refer to a specific uh, reservation here, without uh, which the legal act will remain imperfect. And, um, you know, in this case will be basically that the merchant will not be uh, responsible for the wine till it's measured out of the dolia, then it's put into jars, assign the price, and then they will be responsible for the jar sold, just to sum up. So this case shows that the uh, sale of goods in bulk that poses many problems from the angle of Roman jurisprudence, and it has been questioned by many scholars, finds its nest in the practice of Roman merchants who combine the features of the contracts of sale and transport of goods with the use of samples that allow them to provide validity to the transactions and to reinforce the trust among different merchants. In this commercial context, the enormous polysemy of the products exchange and therefore their associated functions leads to interpret these different categories with the greatest caution. So a lot of work still remains to be done in this case. Um, to conclude, I would like to refer to two aspects that summarize some of my thoughts. Uh, on the one hand, we have the concept of craftsman literacy, which was first mentioned by Harris in the work on 1981, 89, sorry. 
Later on, this author proposed the idea of like specialized litera uh, literacy to characterize the decoding skills required for those who work uh, in a specific sector, for example, in the case of trade. And I wanted to highlight that because, as I said, these sort of co uh, containers are written reflecting the world of merchants. This is not reserved for people who are actually, you know, like, like purchasing the items or for people who are not familiarized with this sort of tools or with this sort of writings. On the other hand, we must think of the legal schemes that surround commercial inscriptions, which are, for example, represented in the various texts that we have in the compilations. In this case, we can say that by reading legal sources, is it possible to see if law was just formulated by juries thinking of the merchant's legal activities? And in my case, I have to say that I was uh, very uh, pessimistic at the beginning, thinking that, you know, uh, the school of these different scholars of Schultz and many Roman legal scholars basically said that, no, the juries were writing their own thing. They didn't care about practice. Nowadays, I am way more optimistic. I kind of think that each of them has their own language to describe realities. And in that sense, it's kind of like also like a plural understanding of how trade takes place. But I don't think that they are that separated from the realities of each other. But anyway, where does this leave me uh, in relation to inscriptions and to the inscribed commercial artifacts and the law? So then what I'm doing here and what I would suggest to anyone studying trade will be to look at the evidence and the sources from the ground up, up and think, what the parties in a contract think they were doing. If we take this as a starting point, then Roman epigraphy, commercial artifacts, etc., fit into any discussion on economics and trade. And this type of approach allows us also to bridge the gap into normative practice, into different uh, legal orders, into statuses, etc., and allows us to see, for example, when Roman law had influenced uh, law in the provinces and the law of the empire in different ways. So these schemes seen, you know, in uh, this with interest, yeah, in, I sorry, inter intersecting focuses such as, you know, ethnicity, imperialism, more historiography, meaning like how these sources can be understood, uh, indicate that the Roman world of trade and the Roman uh, world of, you know, the empire and the provinces is closer and reflects an elusive and constantly evolving reality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.